So some of this I pulled off of EMS lectures that I could find online. When they talk, you talk about the chest and chest trauma, you're looking for the big things, the open wounds of the chest, the sucking wound, collapsed lung, doing the occlusive dressing taped on three sides to keep this from collapsing, looking for paradoxical movement of the chest, looking for flail chest, looking for absent or inadequate breath sounds, putting the patient on positive pressure ventilation, giving oxygen, looking muscle retractions for asymmetrical chest movement, auscultation for chest sounds. These things you guys are all really good at because you're looking for the lethal six. Airway obstruction, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, open pneumothorax, massive hemothorax, flail chest. You're good at finding these things. And so we're going to move on beyond them. What's the basis of exam of the chest? This is what they told us in Degau and Degauen. Look at it, touch it, listen to it. You're going to hear the same thing over and over again, every part of the body. Look at it, touch it, listen to it. You know what the chest is. 12 ribs on a side, sternum in the middle, lungs inside. This is an upright exam. But when you're looking for rib fractures, they've historically taught the compression test. If you push the chest front to back, it'll compress that rib, it'll move that rib, the patient will have pain. This is pretty easy when you're li the patient's lying on the ground, push them against the ground a little bit, you can tell where their rib fractures are. Injuries to the chest wall will have pain with chest movement. The most common movement, breathing. So when a patient breathes, they complain about pain, that's probably a chest wall injury, not an internal injury. We can usually find flailed chest. A section of the chest may not be moving the same way. A large section of the chest wall will be tender, bruising. The pneumothorax that's hidden. Patient has crepitus everywhere. You touch them touch and it's rice krispies on the chest. But some of the other things, uh, this is Mondor disease. Patient has a thrombosed um, vessel on the chest wall. You'll see these a lot in patients who are shooters. They'll, have, they'll get an infected vein. Some people will just get a spontaneously uh, thrombo, spontaneous thrombophlebitis of a vein. This is tender to palpation, but not tender with breathing. So this is outside the chest wall. A shoulder dislocation. Not just the deformity, but these patients will also have that pain with respiration because you're moving that part of the chest wall. The shoulder, shoulder girdle makes a significant portion of the chest wall. This can often be confused for a traumatic injury. Pectus excavatum or carna, carnatum. Excavatum, the sternum goes in. Carnatum, it comes out, or pigeon chest, we've called it. This was much more common when people had rickets. Here in Ohio, I've had a vitamin D deficiency myself, but nowadays we don't see it as often, but if you see a patient like this, this may not because their chest hit the steering wheel, it may just be their normal formation, so it's worthwhile to ask them. Whereas a sternal fracture, you're not gonna see a depressed chest, they're just gonna have tenderness for that palpation and respiration right over the sternum. Barrel chest. How do you recognize barrel chest? Barrel chest is emphysema, COPD. So that's the difference. A bigger, higher sternum for a patient gaining volume for their respiration. So if you see that in a patient, think COPD. Intercostal neuralgia. So the chest wall doesn't hurt, but it hurts on palpation. So you're not having a change in respiration. You're not having a change in what you see but they're tender over a particular band or dermatome. So the chest is innervated from the spine in segments. Early on, they'll just be tender or have pain, and later on, they'll develop the classic blisters of a herpes zoster. If they don't have this and have tender, you also have to consider the fact that they may have injured a spinal nerve. If they have, if they have a pre-existing bulging disc, their accident has caused them to compress this. They may have a specific dermatome that's tender, whereas they're not tender with movement. 
We know where the lungs are. We know about the lobes of the lungs. This is the anatomy of them from the outside. So where the upper lobes, the lower lobes sit. More importantly, when you're listening, you've looked at them, you've palpated them, now you listen. This is specifically where you're not going to hear anything, where you are going to hear anything. Centrally in the chest, you're going to hear anteriorly breath sounds. Lowerly, you're going to have the diaphragm in the center of the heart. In the back, remember, you've got the shoulder blades. You may not hear breath sounds very well through those. You're going to hear different breath sounds in different locations. Up in the th neck, the tracheal sounds, bronchovesticular centrally, and then the lung itself laterally. So just because you hear breath sounds centrally doesn't mean you have a lung that's up. A couple of specialized pains of the chest. If you have an injury to the diaphragm or an injury in the abdomen that's causing irritation to the diaphragm, you, if it's peripherally in the diaphragm, you'll have pain down low. But the diaphragm is innervated by nerves from the neck. So you're going to have pain in the shoulder. Pain in the patient's shoulder without mobility pain is probably from somewhere else, and that's usually the diaphragm. So if you see that, think, does the patient have intra-abdominal injury? Have they blown out their diaphragm during their accident? Go look these up online. Essentially, it goes through where you're going to hear breath sounds and what the finding is, from a small effusion to a bronchial plug, consolidation of the lung, which may be pneumonia, large effusion where you're not going to hear sounds, emphysema, what we talk about really with closed pneumothorax and tension pneumothorax in the middle, you're not going to hear very good breath sounds over that area. We all know the deviated trachea, the hyper-resonant sounds or no sounds over that wall. Not every diagnosis will be this easy. So that's the chest, slowly and thoroughly going through the chest, listening, looking, feeling, looking for that abnormality, identifying abnormalities that are chronic, barrel chest, pectus, palpating, and identifying that when their chest wall moves, if it hurts, that's an injury to those ribs. If it hurts with and without movement, it's probably nerve or something deeper inside. So the abdomen. What you're really looking for in a trauma is internal bleeding into the abdominal cavity. This is one of those big black boxes in the patient. You can lose a lot of blood into the belly and there's a lot of things that bleed. Pain, tenderness, a rigid abdomen, all these things should make your high on your concern that the patient may go into shock. A rigid abdomen might be bleeding. It might also be a perforation and infection going on. Evisceration. We can usually see this one. If you see bowel, you cover it with a moist dressing. Broken pelvis, pain, tenderness, instability, deformation of the pelvis or femurs. This is another patient that might go into shock. You guys recognize these things early. But more deep into this patient, again, inspect, palpate, auscultate. Look touch, listen. Some simple terms when we talk about the abdomen, we have the umbilical region, left upper quadrant, right upper quadrant, right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant. Then we start talking about the lumbar regions, which we might also call the flanks, the hypogastrium, which is actually the lower part of the abdomen, and the epigastrium up in the upper abdomen, between the ribs and the sternum. This will be a common finding, striae. If a patient has had rapid expansion of their abdomen, this is pregnant ladies, uh, this is a completely normal finding. Sometimes these will be very pigmented. You might also see these guys in patients who have gained a lot of weight quickly or who are bodybuilders, completely normal. Cullen's sign. Cullen's sign is one of those things they always talked about and we don't even look for anymore because we're going to scan them. This is important for you. Patient with peri-umbilical bruising probably has retroperitoneal bleeding. 
the blood is tracking from the back all the way through to the front because it's all one space. The space connects. So if you have a lot of blood in the retroperitoneum, and what can bleed in the retroperitoneum? The kidneys, the vena cava, the aorta, the iliac vessels, major things can bleed and it can fill up and you won't notice it until the patient's in shock because it's a slow process in a deep hidden place. But if you see this level of bruising, it should be high on your list of concern. Gray Turner signs, same thing. You'll see bruising, bruising over the flank, especially in an area that's not particularly tender. That blood is tracking from something deeper. This one's tough. Looking at the patient to decide if they've got abdominal distension or they're just plain obese. Uh, some of the deeper patterns of obesity will have mostly fat on the inside. This is that good old apple-shaped obesity. But if you see a patient who has distension like this, I always find it good just to say, is this normal for your belly? That's a little less offensive than, are you normally fat? Uh, <laughs> so looking for this abdominal distension that's abnormal can be blood. It can be they've got a significant infection and they're dumping fluid into their abdomen. They might have an obstruction that they're dumping fluid. Somebody whose abdomen is distended is almost always going to be volume behind. The basic palpation of the abdomen, this is the classic uh, rebound and touch. It's important to make a distinction between, again, like the chest, skin tenderness, muscle tenderness, deep tenderness. Because, we, and because on the surface, the tenderness and pain is much different than deeper. Like we talked about with the segmental neuralgia, that's skin tenderness as soon as you touch. If you can get there to relax their abdominal cavity, what you're feeling is truly the tenderness from inside. Where does pain occur? Gallstone colic is going to be in the right upper quadrant. But, much like we talked about that diaphragm on the left, on the right, if you have diaphragmatic irritation, you're going to have pain in the scapula and the shoulder blade. That's usually abdominal injuries. Small intestine colic is going to be centrally. Renal stone colic or large bowel colic might be mixed in places. This is where the patient complains of pain as opposed to where you will find tenderness when you examine them. Tenderness, when you examine them, is going to be right over where the problem is. Right upper quadrant, gallbladder and kidney. Left upper quadrant, spleen and kidney. Centrally, stomach, pancreas. Right lower quadrant, diverticulitis or appendicitis. Left lower quadrant, diverticulitis, cancer. Uh, low centrally, obstruction. So where you're, if, you're, if their patient is very localized tenderness, that is pain on palpation, that generally means they have a localized process. If they're tender with a rigid abdomen throughout, they've got something much more aggressive going on. How do you tell the difference? How do you get them to do that? If you really want to know what's the difference between inside and outside, bending the knees works really well. It relaxes those abdominal muscles. If you've ever done one of these 22-year-old road warriors and tried to examine their abdomen, they can tense it up pretty darn hard, and you'll never know what's going on inside their belly. But if you can get them to relax, sometimes you can tell the difference. On this case, sometimes patients will have a mass. This is talking about a mass. If you have tense abdominal muscles, you're not going to feel anything. If you can relax it, you'll be able to tell if it's up on the surface or down deep. It won't always be this easy to tell. The, on the left, that's an abdominal wall mass. On the right is an intra-abdominal mass. If you tense up on the right, you're not going to feel anything inside. On the one on the left, you're definitely going to be able to palpate this no matter how tense they are. Another thing with distension to differentiate is ascites. Sometimes abdominal distension isn't fat and it's not something bad going on. It's just fluid that's filled up in there because they have ascites, generally due to liver, liver, uh, chronic liver disease and things like that. How do you tell? Because the, where it's firm shifts. I haven't talked about percussing that much, 
but for cussing was something they made sure to drill into us in medical school, and I use it maybe once a week now. Uh, some people use it a lot more than I do. Um, it can really tell you a difference in sound, and if that sound difference shifts, that's fluid shifting. Another way to do it is to push on one side and feel the wave slap to the other side, sort of pushing on the ocean. These are all views of ascites. One of the thing, hallmarks of ascites is that pop-off valve in the middle. Okay. So as soon, as soon as there's too much pressure, it's trying to find a way out. They get those big umbilical hernias. You might see that with obesity. You won't see it with distension unless it was pre-existing. A moment on hernias. I'm a surgeon. We make our living on hernias. Hernia is any outpouching through an opening in a muscle structure when you're talking about the abdominal wall. Up on the top, you can see how some of the intestine can poke out. We talk about various types of hernias. Reducible means you can push it back in. They've got something big in their groin, you touch it, it goes right back in, that's reducible. Incarcerated, it won't go back in. Strangulated, it's stuck and dying. Only the last one's a surgical emergency. Incarcerated, we try to get fixed now. Reducible is sometimes just no big deal and they can live with it the rest of their life. We see all kinds of hernias with this. Incisional, epigastric, umbilical. So let's make a distinction first. Sometimes you'll see this patient. He doesn't have a hernia. He's got what's called diastasis recti. His rectus muscles have naturally grown apart. This is not an abnormality and doesn't need anything done about it. You have them lie down. When they lift their head up off the bed, they just have a bulge there. It's never bothered them except that they notice it. We'll get in a moment how to tell that from ventral hernia. Umbilical hernia, these are natural defects. Most people have this when they're born. Most hernias close by age three. Some people persist their whole life. There's always a tiny little opening. I use it for all my laparoscopic surgery. Everybody's got a hole there unless it's been fixed. Some are fingertips, some are thumb sized, some are baseball sized. The issue with umbilical hernia, like we mentioned though, is it may indicate there's an increased abdominal pressure from something else, ascites, infection, bleeding. Ventral hernia. Well, what the heck's the difference between this and that diastasis recti I mentioned before? Look for the scar. A ventral hernia means they've had something cause an opening between their rectus before, usually an operation. These are more serious than diastasis recti. These are not natural. Inguinal hernias usually aren't that obvious, um, but it can be a small bulge. If the bulge is visible or palpable, that's more than just a normal inguinal hernia. And if it's tender or if it's red, that's a surgical emergency. And that might be the source of all their trouble. One other thing you might run across if you listen to people's bellies enough uh, is bruies. When you listen to the abdomen and you hear a rubbing noise or a whirring noise, that usually means vascular disease probably not what's causing them an acute problem, but these type of breweries are also indication that they've got bad atherosclerotic disease in a lot of cases, and what may be going on, them having an MI, them having a stroke, them having an ischemic foot, this might just confirm your, your thoughts on that. A few other neat findings, Keput medusae, patient who has significant liver disease, gets obstruction of their portal vein because of the high pressure in the liver. The blood's got to find a different way around. So it uses the routes through the belly, through the esophagus, through the hemorrhoids. This is usually a lot more fun than trying to look at the hemorrhoids. So what you'll see is lots of veins on the abdominal wall. And like you see on the right one, also the, the distension of ascites. Uh, just some more anatomic stuff. When you look at the back, the kidneys are hidden up among, behind the rib cage, so they're usually pretty protected. The spleen is in that left upper quadrant. 
So things to keep in mind, if you see rib fractures in the back, you, you see rib fractures on the left, you gotta be concerned about kidneys and spleen underneath those. Why do we worry about injuries so much in the abdomen, these solid organ injuries, these liver, spleen, and kidneys? Because even if you're wearing a seat belt, if you decelerate fast enough, you can tear these. You're supposed to be wearing your seat belt down and low across the hips. I bet you don't see that many that are sitting there. So if it's across the abdomen, all these injuries can happen. The vertebral fracture, the bowel injury, the liver laceration, the splenic laceration, this is what you're gonna find when they have that seatbelt sign. Sometimes it's easy. Gunshot wound, right lower quadrant with evisceration, moist towel. One last thing to mention, the hip fractures, keep these in the back of your head. Even isolated acetabular fractures can bleed a lot and they'll bleed into the retroperitoneum. So look for those gray Turner sign, that Cullen sign, bruising in places that you wouldn't expect them from their injury. And if their legs are shortened, rotated, suspect that they've got the pelvic fracture. This patient has all the above. Thanks. I've got a few minutes if there's any questions. Absolutely, absolutely. And it's all based upon how big the defect is, and there's just no way to know it. No matter how big that bulge you see is, they might have a big defect, in which case there's no chance of strangulation. This is the umbilical hernias. And if it's a small defect, they have a high risk of strangulation. So it's always concerning. If it pushes back in easy, if it's not tender, it's not red, you're probably okay. And there's no reason to crank on these. That's, that's my job. It's fun for me. All right, thanks.